Uh, she's born and raised in Brazil. She co-founded the Londonian studio Bossa, uh, creators of World of Drift, uh, Surgeon Simulator, High and Bread. Uh, Roberta is a very truly inspiring person. Uh, she helped me uh, design this event in a way. Uh, so I'm super happy to have her there. And I can't wait for you to learn more about her story, uh, how she created Bossa, and what they're doing to uh, try to make Bossa a more creative and diverse place. Please welcome Roberta Luca. I'm going to try to combine the mic and holding my notes at the same time. Um, thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so research shows that when applying for jobs, uh, men typically click apply when they think they have 30% of what is required for the role. And women click apply when they think they have 70% of the requirement of the role. That's true, yes, everyone nodding. <laughs> um, I was in a, in speaking at an event uh, last year at a university in the UK, and at the end of the, 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 the talk, uh, a lady came to me and confessed that she was, work, she was looking for a job in the technology industry for a while, for a few months, in fact, and uh, at some point she decided to change her name to a male name, and in a matter of a week, she started to receive replies from employers. So again, true story, very sad, but that's what's going on in our world of technology and games nowadays. Uh, yeah, I'm Roberta Luca. I'm also known as Beta Luca. Beta is my nickname, uh, and I decided to, do, to become a YouTuber as well as a serial entrepreneur. So I also have a YouTube channel nowadays. I, yeah, I'm Forbes uh, Top 50 Women in Tech. Um, I have to read my, uh, <laughs> my accolades. Uh, so I'm a computer scientist by training. Uh, I'm, I'm also an angel investor nowadays and probably the only Brazilian woman who ever created a games company back in London. And uh, in these eight years uh, since the start of Bossa, we have raised millions of funds from the likes of London Venture Partners, the guys who invested in Supercell and Unity, and also Atomico and Makers Fund. Of course, we didn't start like that, right? We started, I still remember, our first tiny office was uh, a tiny room, actually, in a massive circus space, a uh, real circus, where people learn about trapeze and, you know, clowns everywhere. And uh, we kind of squeezed five of us in this room. And I remember we, we, we were working until like midnight, almost every night, and uh, one day, uh, someone kind of opens the door like abruptly, like it was 11 p.m. or something. And then it says, now, get out of the building now. What are you guys doing here? And then we look at them. At him, he was literally dressed as a clown and with a makeup as a clown. And we were like, okay, now that we had a mini heart attack, let's leave this building and then kind of find somewhere else that is less cheap uh, for us to build the company. So we had all of those kind of crazy stories in the beginning. And I think, you know, the beginning of Bossa was super arduous. Uh, and we, we went to, uh, instead of going through the traditional angel investment and seed investment and Series A, we actually took money quite early on from a strategic investor, which I don't know how many of you have raised funds before, but it's, I do not recommend you do that very much in the beginning. Uh, because chances are, you know, you're going to pivot to your company, things are going to change, your board is going to change completely, and likelihood your visions are not going to align uh, in a few years' time. And that's what happened. And we also went through a very difficult situation to buy the company back from our original strategic investors. Everything was super amicable, everything went fine, but it was a year of negotiation, which, of course, it takes away from our attention to the business. But that was great because it's like it, it allows us to have enough funds and enough uh, trials and errors and failures until we found our north, which is uh, game jams. I don't know how many of you guys here do game jams on an ongoing basis. Do you at all? Yes? 
So at Boston Studios, we have game jams every single month, every month. So we stop the whole company for two days, sometimes three, and uh, the, the teams organize themselves however they want. We usually have a theme, of course, and they create new games. And we usually create 10 new games every month. And through that, we, we say that we scale creativity. So we usually, we actually have this funnel of a lot of, a lot of games. Sometimes people know that, you know, some ideas might be great, but then they turn out to be pretty bad games, and some bad ideas turn out to be great games. And one of those, uh, some of our, our amazing successes, including Surgeon Simulator and Iron Bread, actually came from game jams. Now, the other point that Marshall really wanted me to talk about today, <laughs> which is something that I think we, uh, we became very good at, um, which is diversity, right? So gender diversity in particular. And we, we're not like 50, 50 yet, which is my aim, of course. We're now 80 people, but you know, I want us to expand and be able to, be, to say that we're 50-50 men and women. Um, but we're 25% female, which is double the average in the UK. And I think um, I, I was reflecting about what are the things that we have been doing over these eight years that actually allow us to to create such a big impact, to attract a very diverse workforce. And I think we nailed three things. One of them is deep self-awareness. And what I mean by that is not about the stats that I just told you in the beginning of the, of the talk, but also to understand how people behave differently. And you know, even if you go beyond the stereotypes, uh, there's something that our head, head, uh, head of HR talked to us all the time, which is about uh, the at attribution theory. Have, has anyone heard about that? No? Okay, so I'll try to summarize. Uh, the attribution theory is the following. Men and women attribute successes and failures in very different ways. So when women succeed, they attribute the success to the team, to the support that she had, even to luck. And men attribute success to themselves. When failure happens, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, so women take that really personal and they say, the blame is mine. I made a big, big mistake. And men actually usually connect to external factors. So I think understanding those nuances really help leaders and managers and founders to, on the day-to-day, -day, have the right conversations with the right people to understand where they're coming from so they can adjust their man management styles accordingly. Uh, and I think we, we actually, you know, we have been doing quite deliberately a BOSA to, uh, to instill and to train everyone who's managing people on the day-to-day -to, -day to make sure that they pay attention to those things. Another thing that we uh, women are not very good at is leaning in. <laughs> so you know the, the book that uh, Sheryl Sandberg, Facebook CEO, uh, wrote and the whole movement about leaning in. We, we're not really good at that. We kind of, we're perceived as caregivers. Uh, we're perceived as, you know, sensitive, communal. We embrace that and we tend not to go into the, you know, I'm decisive, I'm a driven person. And, uh, and, and that, of course, hinders us quite a lot. But again, it's about understanding the nuances of behavior. Um, I think the other thing as well, which is very important, is that uh, typically men uh, get promotion based on their potential because they talk about the things that they own to, right? They talk about the vision, they talk about where they're going. And, and women usually get promoted on accomplishment. And the result of that is that sometimes, and I speak you know, as someone who worked in large corporations before and, and became an entrepreneur eight years ago, you kind of get used to talk about your accomplishment. And then you leave uh, your organization to start a company and then you pitch to investors and instead of saying, this is the vision that I have for, you know, for my company and how the world's gonna be different when we when that company exists and is very successful, we actually say, this is the little MVP that I just created. And of course, there's another compounding problem with that because only, uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's in the UK or globally, only 8% of VCs are women. 
So when women are pitching to investors and they, they actually talk on the other side of the table, there's very little relatability to everything, to their behavior, right? Which again, is a problem that, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole general problem that is created on the pipeline of new companies being founded by women and raising funds, of course. And look, there are many, many layers of the discussion. I can go like, you know, talk about this for an hour. I won't. Um, so I think there's a problem with the pipeline as well. A lot of people talk about that. So there are not enough women to, you know, to work in our organizations. We're actually fighting for a very small minority. And it's very interesting that kids uh, love, regardless of gender and, you know, whatever background they have, they love computers and games when they're kids. But then, at some point, when they need to make decisions on their careers, they tend not to go for STEM careers. And STEM uh, stands for science, technology, engineering, and maths. Uh, because, according to research by Microsoft, they found out that girls don't think that technology and games are creative enough, which is very surprising. Um, and I guess it's all about the stereotypes again. They look and say, oh, so I'm not going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, the Elon Musk, although I love Elon Musk. But, you know, they just want to belong to the, to the crowd of the girls who are into beauty and fashion. And that takes me to the second point, which is about role models. And um, I believe there is a reason why I'm pro I probably don't have a very female stereotypical behavior. And I think it's because I had a very, very present um, role model in my life since I was a baby, which is my mom. And I, my mom now, is, she's not retired, but she's been a working mom since ever. She worked in a very male-dominated environment in a financial, big financial institution in Brazil. And she, she was like, you know, high achieving and like, don't, don't care, almost don't care. I'm going to do what I'm passionate about doing. Uh, she divorced from my dad when they didn't love each other anymore. And she was like, yeah, that's, that's how I want to live my life. And I think she kind of instilled that in me and my younger sister, that we can actually uh, do what we want to do, regardless of stereotypes, regardless of what people say to us, right? I know it's, uh, it's complicated because, of course, there's a lot of policies uh, in our countries and in the UK, I'm pretty sure he as well, it's kind of, it's difficult to be a working mom and still raise children, right? And also childcare is super expensive. Um, I was in, a, in an event, uh, maybe, I don't know, three years ago, where there were girls like 10 to 12 year, years old. It was kind of a speed dating type of event, a massive one. And there were a few dozens of uh, people like me, female founders, women in technology, in games. And those girls, they were in groups going from one table to a table to another table to ask questions to us about our careers, what we do, etc. And I noticed that there was a very, a very specific pattern that the most daring girls were the ones who had working moms. And again, I'm not trying to save, save the world with you know, what I'm talking to you right now, but I think it's all important that we understand the, the, the role of role models that we need to have. Otherwise, we're gonna have all the girls just wanting to be famous on Instagram. That's not what we want. We want them working in our companies, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, so at Boston, we have three women in our leadership team. And it's very impressive that every time we hire a new woman, they literally come to me and say, Roberta, it was very refreshing to see those faces on your website and it's, it was a massive decision-making factor that I was so keen to work at Boston because I could see that eventually I could become a leader in this organization as well. And that leads me to the third point, which is consistent action. And uh, as you can see, I have still a little bit of a broken English, uh, even after 12 years in the UK. Uh, so I'm not an activist or anything like that. But I, I do feel a massive responsibility to leave this world a little bit better than, than what I found. And um, I, I love the, the words attributed to Dalai Lama, because you never know what the internet says to you, right? Uh, which is really, really cool. Um, it says, if you think you are too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. 
So I do believe that the very, very small actions make a huge difference. There is a lady called Jess Wade. She's a British physicist. Uh, she, uh, she realized that all of her role models in science and technology were not on Wikipedia. And then she started to write bios for them to put on Wikipedia. And she created some sort of a movement of a lot of other young scientists actually writing bios for a lot of women who were not seen in history on Wikipedia. So all of those little things do make a difference. As I said to you in the beginning, I started this YouTube channel uh, a few months ago uh, to do exactly that. I, I, I spent like most of my life really heads down on my laptop, making companies, you know, I got the bug of entrepreneurship. I, I built many other companies in addition to Boss. I burned out a couple of times and I realized that actually I'm not talking about this enough. I'm not being, you know, the role model that I, I wish, well, I wish I had in the career path, right, uh, apart from my mom, uh, to all these, these young, young girls. And so I decided, and I, again, another piece of research which I think is really, really important, Unilever discovered that 2% of, out of all of the total, out, all, sorry, out of the TV adverts globally, only 2% of them show women as an intelligent person. And that to me was the moment that I said, I cannot stay quiet anymore. I need to be there in the media to change media. We have to change media. I'm not talking about myself as a woman or other amazing women here. I'm talking about you know, all of us to change media so that everything is equal and we have the right role models to people. Also as an angel investor, I, I started to do some angel investing uh, for the last year or so. And I have someone here who I invested <laughs> right in the second row. You should talk to her. She's an amazing female founder. Uh, of course, I do, I do have a skew towards women because, you know, we are underrepresented. Uh, but also, it's very impressive that even though we receive less funding in our companies, we make significantly better uh, revenues and financial returns uh, when you have founding teams that include women as well. Not saying just, just women, but it's like founding teams, they include women. So I think, I think the last point that I want to make is like going back to the mosquito, is, uh, is that I, I do believe that everyone can, you know, have the power to make a little action. Uh, and I think Marsha invited me here because we started this conversation like, there are so many small actions that we can pledge and commit to ourselves that really will make a difference in the future. Uh, and it could be because we're managers, because we're founders, because we, you know, we're parents, because we're investors, we're advisors, whatever. There is always something that we can do to change things. And before I welcome your questions and the very tricky questions from Marshall, I, I want to ask you one question, which is, what is the small action you're going to do tomorrow to uh, increase the gender diversity in your companies or to invest in some really kick-ass female founders? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roberta, for being a role model for all of us. That, that, that was great. Um, do we have any questions for uh, Roberta? First one there. Up. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, Roberta. Um, as a young activist for social uh, equalities and uh, uh, next to be a game designer, well, let's hope. Um, I would like to say uh, first that your speech was very inspiring, so thanks for that. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to precise for uh, French women and also men in the in the room that there is um, a French association named Women in Games uh, that is trying to um, teach to young girls that they can participate in um, technology and engineering and creating video games. Sorry. So uh, it's pretty nice. Uh, all the actions are really 
helping. So I think you might get some info about that. But now the question I have for you, sorry if I get away with that. Um, I wanted to ask what are your plans for the future, um, ever uh, feminist actions or even ga video game projects? So, yeah, good question. I, I, I don't have... It's so funny because that's the first time that I go on stage to talk about this topic. Seriously, that's why I had tons of research. Because I usually talk about achievements and etc. But I thought that, you know, we don't talk about those things enough. And I don't want to be in five years' time complaining that we have not made any action to change things. Because we just gave up on talking about those things, right? Um, so all of the actions that I'm doing right now, they are either regarding making Boston Studios more diverse, and I'm not even talking just about gender diversity, diverse as a whole. Um, also, I think it, it, it's all about putting your money where your mouth is. And I think the small, very, very small tickets of range investment that I do, they, they also very consciously go into people who I believe they are amazing, but they also uh, somehow underrepresented. Um, and I think other than that, it's just about talking on stage, probably more often than that, to, to try to instill this. And, and everything that I talk about on my YouTube channel is not about fashion or makeup or anything like that. I talk about entrepreneurship. I talk about the things that I learned. I talk about failure. I talk about how to raise funds. You know, all of those things, they are practical uh, knowledge that everyone should be inspired to, perhaps, and even put into practice. So to me, it's like inspiration going to practice. That's, that's what I'm all about. Yeah, okay. Christian? Hi, Beta. I'm going to call you Beta, if you don't mind. Hello. Hi, Beta. Thanks for a very inspiring uh, speech. So my, my mom is, is, is a scientist who's on Wikipedia, and she did divorce my dad. Uh, yet wow, she's not my mom. <laughs> <laughs> she's an amazing woman. Um, yet, last year, as a studio head, um, I had a chance to promote someone and there was a girl and a guy fighting for the promotion and I ended up promoting the guy, I think, for, for a lot of right reasons, for, for like you said, the achievements and, and vision and, and also just basically, I thought that person was the right one for the role. But I can't help have a doubt, right? So my question is, there are a lot of male founders and, and studio heads in the audience how do we recognize our own bias? What can we do? Yeah, that's that's excellent question. I think, um, read about the attribution theory. I think it's a really good start. Um, I, I might follow up with that as well. I might ask a few more questions to my head of HR. She might have some more s stuff for you to read about that goes deeper into behavior. Because I think it's, uh, it, it's perception of nuances of language the words that are used in conversations. Um, also, is like, typically, I, I, I wouldn't be here talking today if before I started Bossa, when I worked at Nokia, my boss was hugely encouraging me to be on stage to talk about the things, the projects that I was working on. And I, I was like, no, I'm not gonna do that because I'm not prepared, because, you know, all the excuses. But I, I think it's about incentivizing them to be more upfront about their potential. It's almost like triggering the things that they have inside that they usually don't communicate. Um, did I answer your question? I think, I think that's, that's that it, it's more about the perception of language and perception of um, how they, they talk about the successes and failures and and probing a little bit further, not taking you know the first thing that they talk about as the reality, is going a little bit deeper, asking why. Why are you saying this about yourself? Why do you think you're ready for that? Or why do you think you're not ready for that? Because when you drill into the whys, you start understanding deeper what are their capabilities and potentials. That would be my first advice, okay. We have time for one or two additional questions. I'm almost tempted to say ladies, maybe. <laughs> no? So. Hi. First, thank you for everything you said so far. Really inspiring. Uh, I'm a game design teacher at Isar Digital, and uh, I have this question about uh, 
people applying to our school. Uh, how do we increase the diversity in our school? That's what we, we thrive to have more women and more, more people from all places. But first it starts with coming, you know, in, the, in all the game design schools that we have, but people applying in our school, we have very few women or not enough, actually. How do we convince them to come? Or how do we just uh, tell them that they can come here? Do you have a lot of women working with you? Not enough. Okay. Because that could be a good start. Because once you have that and you put their faces on the website, there's relatability. So that's a very good, very important thing for you to think about. Um, also, I think... Um, I, I'm gonna sound very, it's gonna sound weird what I'm gonna say. It's like, try to make it more kind of cool and arty, the way that you talk about the, the course, because I think there's, a, there's this perception that women have that, oh, this is, this is boys club, or this is not for me, or this is like too nerdy or too geeky, and I prefer to be on my belongings with the, you know, super fashionable and arty people, right? So try to make it more arty uh, and more, and, and, and they, they perceiving that that path is highly creative, that they will be able to exercise, girls will be able to exercise their creativity by joining the course. I think these are the two things that I would suggest to you right now. Opportunity for a last question. Make it count. Ah. <laughs> Disappeared, it's still there. We do games for women. What nice. it means is that the people who, t who download our game, it's like 95% women. And when people ask me, what kind of games do you do? I say, I do games for women. And what does that mean? And immediately you go with the stereotypes. You know what I mean? Yeah. How do you get along with that? Like, it's, how can you say that taking care is only for women? Like, you're a sexist guy, yeah? You see what I mean? I don't. No. I, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay, it's a bit I... different from what you're talking about <laughs> right now, but. No, sorry. Seriously, I'm trying to understand how the problem you're trying to solve. When you make games for women, you make games for a stereotype called a gender. It's not the gender woman, it's a stereotype like taking care of bed or uh, I don't know what other things. If you say that this is for women, it's sexist, isn't it? You don't get it. It depends. <laughs> I don't think saying that you're creating something for women or for men is sexist. It's like, you can say, I, I, I don't know, I, I design shoes for men, or I design men's wear as opposed to women's wear. I think, I think it's fine if you, if you have a niche and you, you believe that that's, you know, these are the kind of games and the kind of audience that you have and you leverage that. I think what, what, what you could do if you want to change the way that they, they if you want to change like the visual circle of, them playing fashion games or I don't know what, what kind of games you, you create, but like playing the type of games that they play to, to think about other games that might be a little bit more, I don't know, male stereotypical. Um, just, I, I, sorry, I, I really don't know how to respond to your question. <laughs> but embrace that, man. It's like, I don't know. I don't think there's a problem with that. I think the, the problem is when you don't have the, the, the right diversity in your company creating those products. I think that, that to me, was the, the fight that I would pick. Thanks a ton, <laughs> Roberta. That was so great. Thanks a lot for that.